Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer, producer, songwriter, Bobby Huff. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, rock and rollers? Rich Redman here. That's right. It's another episode of the Rich Redman Show, and this is like we're by coastal today, man. I'm in sunny Los Angeles. My guest and my co-host, co-producer, man about town, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com. They're coming from beautiful Music City, USA. This technology thing is great, Jim. Mm-hmm. I love that you're here. This is our third day in a row of talking to world-class drummers, and today is no exception. See, that's our guest getting a text because he's so popular and so busy. <laughs> but he's, <laughs> he's a drummer, he's a producer, he's a songwriter, and he's very successful, uber successful in all three of those pursuits. Bobby Huff, how you doing, pal? Hey, I got to run, but thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed right away by watching your new YouTube channel that you have a very uh, left of center kind of quirky um, sense of humor. No. <laughs> there you go, right there. Yeah, there you go, right yeah, there. What's, what's there to be? What's there to be mad about, right? Well, you know what? I, this is I, I love this simple uh, bio you have. As a rockin' touring drummer, you were with Black Hawk and Leanne Rhymes for many years. Great gigs, yeah. and then along yeah. the way, there's so many things that you could tell us about whether you produced them, toured with them, recorded with them, or wrote songs for them. But look at this list, Shine Down, Papa Roach, Leanne Rhymes, Gene Simmons, Rod Stewart, Reba, Simple Plan, Tim Finn, Billy Currington, Sawyer Brown, the list goes on and on. And of course, uh, working for Hailstorm, Disney, ESPN, Nickelodeon, I mean, the stuff, the list goes on and on. How does that all work? How do you find the time? How- you're a drummer, you're a song. When you're in an elevator with somebody and you got five seconds and you got to give them the, what do you do? What do you say? I don't know. No, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard. Like when you say, well, I'm a producer. I don't even know what that is. You know, I mean, you sit around and you, you know, you encourage an artist and, and a lot of times now producer and a programmer are kind of the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, but I started as a drummer. I mean, my, my goal in life was to be Jeff Picaro of Toto. Nice. He was my guy. I mean, like everything Jeff all the time, everything Jeff Lee, he played on sessions. He was in Toto. And so I started out that I practiced all the time. I was a drummer and uh, moved to, I, I grew up in Indiana. Mm. And I, I came to a small, tiny little town in Indiana, came to Nashville, and went to Belmont for a year. Nice. But knew, man, I want to be in L.A. where all my, you know, all my heroes are. Because right. music, I mean, it was 1985. Nashville was much different in 1985. So moved to L.A. and, and actually got to know Jeff and started to play and stuff like that. Nice. So really drumming was my, was my focus. But when the session thing in L.A. kind of started to peter out because Nirvana came and ruined everything for everyone that wasn't that kind of music. (laughs) Oh, my God. And I loved it. I loved it. But we knew, everybody knew we're dead. We're dead. Oh, no. Yeah. Everybody go to Seattle and look for the next band or whatever. I moved back to Nashville, and I reconnected with a, a Nashville friend that I went to Belmont with named Dale Oliver, incredible guitar player. Dale, yeah. Yeah, Dale. And as soon as I got back to Nashville, he said, hey man, there's this thing called Blackhawk. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything about, kind of, I knew who the Judds and Garth Brooks were. That's it. But I knew who Van Stevenson was because he had a rock uh, career and my cousin Dan played guitar on his pop record, and I used to practice to that all the time in my bedroom with uh, drummer Mike Baird. Are you guys hip to Mike Baird? Yeah, Mike Baird, um, and and he's still out here. And I think what I heard is he's he's working in the film industry now because the could be the insurance be. and the medical is killing. Oh yeah, but and he played with Journey for a while. Yeah, great stuff. But anyway, so I came here, and that's how I got my first gig. I. I I, Dale kind of said, Hey, I want, uh, you guys need to listen to this guy. We went in the studio. Their record had already been 
made, but I went in and played three demos with them. They said, yeah, you got it. So that was my first taste of Nashville and jumping in the country thing. And those guys were great to me. Great. To so me. what was that like 1990, 1991? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that was, that was perfect timing because that was the boom of country music. Alan Jackson gone country. It's like the yes. drums were getting hotter in the mix. Yeah. Eddie and Lonnie and they're just turning yes. up the snare drum and yeah. It started to maybe get on my radar a little bit, and I, and I came after the boom in 1997, and it was a little okay. sleepy for a couple years there. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because Blackhawk, I could relate to Blackhawk because it was a little bit like John Mellencamp and a little bit like the Eagles. Yeah. So, and you know, and Lonnie did play on that. Uh, I think he played on some or half of the first record, and I, I immediately gravitated towards his drum. It's like, okay, right. it's aggressive. He's you know. Big so, crash cymbals. Yeah, like great player, great time, great groove. So I kind of found my way in through that. And the and the Blackhawk live show, much like the shows you play and all that, was over the top rock in your yeah. face. You know, it's yeah. like now you did know, you do that gig with our buddy Tully Kennedy? I just got off the, the phone with Tully. Basically. I did. I did. That's how I, I met Tully way back then, and Tully. Um, Tilly and I got involved in another little side thing I had going on when I was starting to write songs. And God, I, I haven't seen Tilly forever, but what a great hug, guy. Hug, song, right? Man. Hug, H-U-G-G. -G. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That, that was basically me knowing that I don't want to tour forever and I really want to get into production and writing. So when we would tour, I would haul in a mixer and an ADAT and an MPC 60 drum machine every day to the hotel. Cause we'd have, you know, you have all day long to do nothing until sound check. So I'd haul all that shit into a hotel room and sit there and, and learn how to program and, and write and record on an ADAT wow. machine. So That's those smart. songs came out of that because I wanted to get a publishing deal. Nice. And then you eventually sure. you did it right with a really good publisher. Was it, is it 1010 or? What was it? Yeah, it was 1010. I got my first publishing deal for three years for, with EMI, and then after that went right to 1010, and they were fantastic to me. I mean, that's yeah. really, as a songwriter and a producer, they really broke. I love that. So I love that you had that clarity and that wherewithal to say to yourself, yeah, I'm having a great time with this band, but as far as the lifestyle of touring, I don't know if I want to do this for 20, 30 years like a lot of my friends and people that I look up to. It's so funny. I can't believe it. Like I, my first time I jumped on a bus was probably maybe April or May of 1997. So it's been like yeah. 23, 24 years without uh -huh. fail. It's like every Wednesday driving to Kroger, yeah. loading my suitcase. It's just been yeah. part of my life. But yeah. I love the fact that you're like, no, I'm going to do different things. Well, the good thing about touring the country is you can have a life. Yeah. You know, you can have, you know, I had a wife and kids. You can still make ball games and school stuff. And because it's, it's not like rock where you go, okay, you know, honey, I'll be home in nine months, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. See you later. So that wasn't so bad, but I don't know, just in my, in my DNA or, the, or the kind of guys that I really looked up to growing up, you know, whether it would be, Jeff or Mutt Lang or David Foster or these kind of guys. I always kind of, ha I always loved the laboratory. Yeah. I always loved the studio and I was thankful for the work on the road. Cause I mean, I have any, I didn't have any production or writing work. So I was thankful for that. I met a lot of people through Blackhawk. I played on their records and it really helped the whole thing. But I knew instinctively, man, I, the studio is kind of, that's where I feel at home. You know? I love that. I love right. it. And so where is your studio that you're coming from right now? Is it on Music Row? Is it in your house? Yeah, this, this one, um, this, I'm at my house now. I live in Hendersonville on Old Hickory nice. Lake. But um, so I do a lot of programming, a lot of mixing, overdubs and stuff. Um, I don't do live drums here. I have a couple studios around town where I have drum sets up, uh, drum set up. Yep. One's kind of like a 70s kind of room. The other one's kind of a modern rock room. And I just let them have my drums there all the time. And so when I have something to play on, they just let me come in and play for free. That's really so smart. This is mostly mixing, overdubbing, programming. And then, you know, I go downtown and write two or three days, you know, before COVID. I go yeah. downtown, write two or three days a week. I, I have a publishing deal at Black River, which owns Soundstage, where you did your sample pack. Logged a lot of hours in Soundstage. 
Yeah, it's an amazing place. Yeah. Uh, amazing people. So, you know, I kind of bounce. I'm like you guys, man. I bounce all over. I work, Wherever, wherever they let me come and hang my hat for a while, I'll, I'll stay yeah. there. So, Jim, yeah, Jim, Jim, you know, Jim's, Jim inspires me over the years as well. He, he has changed his, uh, you know, everything he does is entrepreneurial. He does a, we, he makes fun of how I pronounce that, but I make sure I get all the syllables. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he's producing like 10 podcasts and doing voiceovers and, really? for, you know, car dealerships. And when you call a company and you're like, press one to that's Jim, you know, so. Nice. Jim. But Jim, as a drummer, he never lost the bug as a drummer. Neil Peart is his guy. We actually found oh, yeah. out of the passing of Neil on our show. It was, it was oh, crazy. Man. We were recording an episode. Well, Jim, were, did you, were you ever into Jeff Picard? You know, I did. So I, I remember reading of his passing in the Modern Drummer magazine, and uh, you don't really have an appreciation for him, I think, until you get older. Yeah. Uh, my son, oddly enough, being nine or 10 years old when he was really playing drums, wanted yeah. to master Rosanna. Of yeah. All songs. So yeah. he actually got yeah. very close. I think he I got remember close. he went, just jumped into the deep end of the pool there. Yeah. But Bobby, that had to be pretty incredible, right? To like, oh, you have a hero of yours. You move to the city that that guy lives in. And you've got to be a fly on the wall. Some people just have this thing, this it factor. They only come around every 10 years or so. He was that yeah. guy, right? Yeah. And <laughs> I was bound and determined that he was uh, that he was going to be my friend and he was yeah. going to dig me. You know, I, I just I, I probably knew every ghost note in every song he ever played. So I moved out there and I, you know, got in kind of, you know, and and went in, saw him in a couple sessions and he, you know, he took a shine to me. I, I, <laughs> I gave him it came with like cassette. lollipops. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Money and a cassette. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. And. No, it was really, um, it was wonderful. He was a super guy, a super, he, he shared everything he knew, you know, would you know, invite me to sessions and, you know, and I, I, I have a, um, before he passed, I have a, I have a cassette tape that he, he was going to, I was going to go down to the baked potato, the, the yeah. club where all those guys used to play all the time, you know, Lukather, all those guys, the jazz place. And he said, man, come down Sunday night and sit in a couple songs. Cause he was kind of helping me out getting me gigs. I was like, Oh man, that's incredible. And he called me Sunday about noon and said, Hey, he, and he left a voicemail on my uh, machine and said, Hey Bobby, man, my session today is going to a triple. I'm not, I'm not going to play at the potato tonight. Uh, Vinny's going to play instead, but we'll do it another time. And I never talked to him again. That was the last, ah. I still have that message. I still have that message. And they were they were going in to do rehearsals for their last record that uh, their tour that the last record that Jeff played on Kingdom of Desire and he had invited me down to some of those rehearsals and I never saw him again and and never got to go to the rehearsals but I think That's about cool. him every day and and ah. his his music's in my life and you know it's just it's it was a crazy thing when he passed I mean but just like Neil you know yeah. like yeah and I, and, I, and you know, in the, in the drum community, music community, you kind of hear rumors and all that. I didn't know one thing. I didn't know that Neil was sick or anything. He was yeah, such he a it. private guy. Yeah. Very private. And very private. Never liked I, the limelight. Never liked celebrity or that anything that came with it. Yeah. He just liked so to write nice. about the limelight, right? Yeah. <laughs> ah! No, but I have, a, I have a funny rest story. I work with a producer a lot, David Bendith, producer and mixer. Great, great guy. Um, he's from Canada. He produced Paramore and Papa Roach. Great. Just amazing talent. Anyway, he grew up around uh, Getty Lee and Alex. Wow. And, and Getty Lee's actual real name is Gary. Gary Lee. But he had this, like, Hasidic grandmother that would call out, call outside at, like, you know, 5 o'clock at night when Getty, it was time yeah. for them to – to come in for dinner and see, he'd say, Getty, Getty, time for dinner, Getty. So that's how he got his name, Getty. Oh my God. Yeah, that's, that's that right? I think his last name is, it might be Leibowitz or something like that. Oh, too. it's really, that yeah. makes sense. I had, a, I had a great, awesome grandmother, Ida Paradiso, and I joke about this all the time, and I was a little pudgier as a kid because she was always feeding me. That's how Italians show love. So she'd go, Richie, I have a Portuguese roll. It's hot. I got it all buttered for you. It'll hold you <laughs> over until dinner. What's for dinner? 
Raviolis, bread, But salad, mom, it's four o'clock. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, you know how much exercise oh, I'd have to do to burn off that Portuguese roll? Oh, but back man, then, yeah. we were, we're climbing trees oh, yeah. and yeah. it was, we were so active. My God. That's awesome, man. In- That's incredible. Killer. Uh, and yeah. and so uh, looking at some of these uh, talents, the the the, mm-hmm. the rock names, your Shine Downs, your Papa Roaches, your Gene Simmons, Rod Stewart, Drowning, our Uncle Crack, are those uh, were those songwriting sessions? Were they drumming sessions? Most of those were songwriting. Nice. Um, the Gene Simmons thing uh, was I produced a band for him that was on his label Simmons Records. Oh yeah, um, which was which was phenomenal because i mean i had gene's picture on my locker as a kid and yeah the, the, the crazy thing is is you know I, yeah he's so like intimidating to like see and on tv and you know he's the demon bigger than life most polite guy i've ever worked with wow he would say he would email me like mix changes and go his his way of saying it would be could you kindly turn the drums up uh one db could you kindly turn the guitar solo up? Like super wow. respectful, great guy. Nice. But a lot those other ones, Shine Down, Papa Roach, Drowning Pool, those were writing, those were writing things. Um, um, and then did you do some composition for the Disney's and ESPN's? Is that like TV and film music, or was it yeah. just like pop songs that were placed? Both. Both. Yeah. I did some pop songs for Disney. Um, a girl named uh, Sabrina Carpenter. Um, oh yeah. But a lot of um, a lot of stuff in movies and soundtrack. Um, uh, what are some of Chronicles of Narnia movie? Oh wow! Um, uh, what was the um, C.S. Lewis yeah. Tomorrowland? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm a huge C.S. Lewis fan anyway, so that was kind of yeah. cool. Um, and I do a really? lot of scoring. Yeah, I do a lot of scoring and um, and a lot of TV and film. Most of my music life now is probably TV, film, and, um, you know, ad stuff. You know, now, where, I, where, where does that connection come from? Because that seems to me like it's like an L.A., Chicago, Atlanta thing. It is. It's all L.A. It, it's all L.A. But just being around long enough and meeting lots of people and music supervisors, you know how it is. You know, yeah. you, relationships. You collect, yeah. yeah. You collect people along the way and, and relationships and numbers and – um, I'm working with a, a really great company in LA right now too called the bus and they just know everyone. They just yeah. know, you know, all the, so a lot of programming, a lot of, um, and, and it's really interesting too, because one day you're doing something that sounds like John Williams, mm. only, only not as good. <laughs> the, the next day you're doing something that sounds like, you know, total urban. The next day it's EDM. And so it's, it's interesting. You get to, you don't get into a rut where you go one, four, two, minor, six, four, five, one, you know, yeah. yep. so okay. it, 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 it's fresh and it's cool. And it's, it's fun that way. Yeah. And being in Nashville, you know, I do country stuff. We all, you know, that's part of it's in our DNA here. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm, uh, developing a new guy that we're getting a little bit of love from the label right now. So fingers crossed yeah. with um, a manager named Eric Hurt. His name's Styles Howery. He's got some stuff out online and uh, nice. it's going really good. So just like you guys, man, you kind of, you piece together a life of things you like to do and that you're interested in and with people that'll let you do it with them. You know, yeah. the, the days of, you know, I always thought, I always thought when I was young, you know, hey, I want to be Jeff Picaro, or I, I'm, I'm going to be a studio drummer. And that that job doesn't exist anymore, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, yeah. there's, there's you can you can piece together a li- some kind of living at it, but like all the guys in Nashville that play, you know, um, you know tour, to, yeah, tour with Sheryl Crow, or tour with Jason, or yeah. tour with Keith Urban, or whatever. So well, Was it, that kind of kinda, like a getting it out of your system because i can relate us all being drummers we seem to get our hands in a lot of different things yeah and oddly enough because we can you know do many different things with our limbs at once or at the same different times and stuff like yeah. that so your path is similar to mine because i i went into radio uh never wow. really pr- you know pursued the drum thing or, or playing a drums for for a profession but i wanted to be an on-air talent and i tried that in connecticut and it was kind of like, eh, I'd rather be in the production studio. 
So yeah. very similar. Yeah. I get what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. yeah no. I mean, I remember just, just like maybe uh, I would say eight years ago um, where I felt like, I mean, yeah, eight, 10 years ago, I could on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, do two, three sessions a day. Some were very by the book. They, you know, they were union and all the traditional guys that you would see playing one, four, five, six, yeah. uh, I, you know, on a chart over and over and over. And that was really fun and cranking out tons of demos. And, but then I felt like the time, the file sharing changed things. And then there was less publishing deals, less money in that the track guys came in. And then I felt like a new guard of not that I don't work anymore. I do the work that I want to do. I have a studio that I do the work that I want to do from, but then I started like kids that I taught how to read music, like Miles McPherson, you know, is yeah. doing sessions and you're Jerry Rose. And there was these guys that were coming in and I was like, Oh, this is maybe a sign that, Gotta, um, you know, expand and, and then, yeah, yeah. And you, you do the drums that you want to do, but then I started a, a production company with Kurt and Tully yeah. and that was 10 years and then a five year uh, writing songs for five years. And I thought, so that's probably, a, I'm assuming that's advice you would give to a young person that came, would come up to you and say, how do I do this, Bobby? <laughs> Just <find Yeah>. it. <laughs> how do yeah, I do I mean, this? When you look back, I, I go, I have no idea, yeah. but but now your cousin said is, the same thing. It's, <laughs> no it's, idea. People look at your life and they say, <laughs> no. man, how did you plan this out? And you're like, I didn't. It just happened. Oh, yeah. accident after accident yeah. and meeting some key person along the way that gives you work. And, you know, but I think what you're saying is right. I mean, staying fluid and staying – because even the greatest players and all, all of my favorite bands growing up, everything has a season. And then that season yeah. changes, you know, yeah, um, you know, the, the great studio guys of the eighties or the great bands of the eighties. I mean, everything or the nineties and the two thousands, everything changes. So continue to, to reinvent yourself and, and to look at, well, I kind of like doing that, like in, in finding different ways and people and, and opportunities to plug in because the new guard, the new guard comes along. The new the new producer that has a hit gets more acts. And that producer hires his musicians instead yeah. of Rich or Bobby or Jim or Lonnie Wilson, you know. So you kind of have to stay ahead of that game. Somebody said that, um, well, I, I saw a thing on Paul Lyme. I think Paul's been on your show, right? Yeah. Yeah. They said in L.A., he said, I'm, I'm quoting Paul, he said, when you're 40 years old in L.A., your record career is done. So you, you've got to learn how to read well and do movie and TV stuff. So that's what happened with him. He got a lot of movie and TV stuff. But then he moved here and got a whole new record career because here it, it didn't matter as much your age, you know. And he was an L.A. guy, and that was cool. And, you know, played on the biggest records ever. I mean, Shania Twain. Oh, you're right. Battlestar now. Galactica, Star Wars, you know. Exactly. Um, but, hey, that really makes me think about something. The idea of being able to read a cue, read it down in real time with a click track. School of Rock. Can you imagine? We, they're the sponsor of our show. They're the title sponsor of our show. We love them. There's 250 locations. There's two amazing ones in Nashville and Franklin and in uh, in Nashville and Franklin, and they're run by our good friends, Angie and Kelly McCright. Angie and Kelly McCright, boom. Uh, can you imagine if we had something like that growing up? Uh, I mean. It would have been unbelievable. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Indiana. All I had, I had a local music store. Sure. And I had a, I had a lot of, um, there were some great musicians that would come in a local studio and some great musicians at my church that would also were from a university and all I, between needle dropping and trying to figure stuff out on a, 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 a I sound like heroin, but no, I'm talking yeah, about yeah. records and asking everybody I knew anything that I could figure out. There was, you know, no YouTube, no, no. So to have a school like that where you could really get useful information that like, Real information that you'd really use in the music world would have been yeah. amazing. 
And so, so incredible. And, Amazing. and Jim and I talk about it all the time. It's like, even for the parents out there, if your kids, they're going to learn drums, they're going to learn the front to bang, they're going to learn to play keyboards, bass, guitar, but more importantly, even if they don't become professional musicians, they're going to learn all these life skills, which is how to work in a band and working yes. in a band, that democratic process, being able to take direction from people yeah. and not be offended and show up on time and setting oh, goals and being in a team. So we love yeah. it. Jim, tell us about how to get in touch with the folks at School of Rock in Nashville and Franklin. Two email addresses, Nashville at schoolofrock.com and Franklin at schoolofrock.com. Yeah, and tell them that Bobby, Jim, and Rich sent you. We love the School of Rock. Yeah, man. Because I was going to ask you what your your background is. Because for me, it was like I was hitting everything in sight. And my dad said, we're going to take you to the drum shop. And I got the little pad. And next thing you know, I'm playing five-stroke rows. Jump, jump, jump. You know. Yeah, my dad was a drummer, <laughs> so he showed me, do, 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 you know, even better, all those even things. better, yeah. And then, um, man, I started. I, I, once I figured that out, and he showed me a few other things. I just started playing along with like old Elton John records, nice. Mm-hmm. Anything Nigel. that I could, yeah. No, love Nigel. When uh, did you start playing? What um. You- Probably about 1976. Me too. Yeah. And I, I mean, not- you're you're a lo- you're looking to me a lot younger than than you maybe are. I mean, you I'm, look really young. I just I just turned 53. Okay. Yeah, man. You're I just turned. Very, yeah. I didn't so put you a day over 38. So. Oh well, thanks. I'm old. You're welcome. No, I'm you're old. No, you're, you got plenty of time left. A lot of time. <laughs> but. I really, so I started playing along with records I, at, all the time. And then um, I have, I have an uncle who's a, who, what, who was a famous string arranger. And I have a cousin that's a famous guitar player and a cousin that's a famous drummer. So <laughs> I would call them in, in Nashville and, and, or when we would come to see him at Christmas or I would, and, you know, when all my friends at spring break in high school and all that were, you know, getting wasted and late in, in uh, Florida, I would go to their place in Nashville or their place in L.A. and hang out for a week and watch studio guys and all that. So as a young kid, I would always ask them, what should I be? Because they were older than me and I looked up to them and they knew, you know, exactly how to, you know, guide me. And I'd say, what, what should I what record should I buy? What should I be listening to? And they would say, Steely Dan Asia, or Gino Vanelli, Brother to Brother, yeah. or the first Toto record. or So anything they said, I did. I'd go out and buy it, and I would, I would try to learn everything on that record, and over and over and over and over. So that was kind of my formal drum training. I, I had some other musicians that recommended some things how to read, and they taught me some things, and then I would read... Um, I would get, uh, like, there was a Carol King bass book that was all these syncopated. Oh, Carol K. Oh, Carol K. My bad. She was the yeah. Motown bass player. Oh, no, she was yeah. Al Blaine in the Wrecking Crew. Yes, yes. Carol King's the, sorry, I'm 53. <laughs> <laughs> you got so, a friend. But so young. All of these things, all of these lines were super syncopated. You know, super, so I would learn how to read those syncopated lines just so you know how we we do in sessions now you don't there aren't really many rhythms written out but when you see one that's like a group rhythm that's played or whatever you can almost see it and know what it is without going okay but da 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 but 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 uh, you know so th- those kind of things kind of train my eye yeah. i think from reading those syncopated rhythms yeah that, that man sense? Oh, any- any, mm-hmm. of course, any of that training is is, is like fantastic. Yeah. It's like marimba players that'll take like, yeah. you know, a trumpet thing and they'll and they'll work on on you know, yeah. playing concertos and stuff, which is always great. And you know, I do a lot of teaching, so I tell the kids, hey, page thirty eight of Ted Reed's syncopation. It's seven dollars and ninety five cents for this book. So less the cost of two smart coffees at Starbucks. You can get this book. You can change your life. Page 38. I can see it in my mind's eye. So being able to play that on one surface and then being able to put it on a drum set and break it up between the limbs. So that's amazing. Yeah. However, however you get there, you got there. 
Do you guys recall the the rudiment or the uh, exercise you hated doing when you were, uh, you know, under 10 years old? Well, now I'm going to expose myself. All of them. I think the only (laughs) rudiment I know is a double stroke roll and a paradiddle. See, paradiddles, I, even after almost 35 years of playing, I'm just like, I don't know what to do with these things. Oh, it's, it's, it was terrible. I didn't have, I didn't have the patience for it. I wish I'd, I mean, here I am, an old guy on the internet saying what we hear, you know. I Get wish off my I lawn! Have, yeah, I wish <laughs> I would have, yeah, I wish I'd have done that. And, and, because and, I would have a different set of chops. Yeah. You know. Did you do I've, marching band and everything in high school? No, I flunked no. out of band in sixth grade. And it's no. Jeff Beccaro's fault. Because <laughs> in sixth, it's Jeff Beccaro's fault. In sixth grade, my band teacher said, you have to hold your sticks like this, traditional grip. Yeah, That's what yeah. we do. And I told her, Jeff Beccaro from Toto doesn't hold his sticks like that. So there's no way I'm going to hold my sticks like that. So she gave me an F and I quit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So I wish I was, I, I wish I had better hands. I wish I had better rudimentary, rudiment chops. You know, I look at guys like, you know, Vinny and Dad and Wackle and I just go, oh my God, they, that's beautiful. They, they just play beautifully. My I'm chops are a little more street chops. Yeah. Um, See, that's how I am. Yeah. Well, yeah. Rich, what about you? Well, Jim has, but Jim, Jim's got like a natural feel. Like Jim will be like, hmm, Hicktown, I can do that. And I have video of him actually just putting on the song and, you know, not, he's not reading a number chart. He's not reading a transcription. He's just feeling it. His time feel is good and he's in yeah. with it. So, it, you know, a lot of the stuff that we end up doing to pay our mortgages and, and to bring joy to people is like some of the most rudimentary stuff you learn in the very beginning. But what yeah. I tell my students is like, if you overtrain, so you have more facility and control and conceptual stuff than you need, then you can dig into the, that bag of tricks. So if somebody is asking you, give me yeah. more, you're not going to hit that plateau, you know? Yeah. So it's just kind of like yeah. over preparing for the situation. But yeah. I, you know, some of my favorite players are also, you know, look at a guy like like uh, with the Zigaboo or something with the meters and he just got this natural thing and it just show oh, up real. and it just sounds gorgeous. Yeah. So um, now it's just one of these industries where there is no rhyme or reason yeah. or path. You just have to find your way with a smile on your face. And really it is relationships. I mean, I can't even yeah. believe I'm coming up on 24 years in Nashville and I can think of a Nashville family tree of a handshake that turned into an opportunity I did well on the opportunity. That was my way of saying thank you. And that person recommended me to another person. It did not happen overnight. No. Oh, man. And it, and it's not, it, it will continue to be that way for us as long as we're in this, you know, meeting yeah. people. And, but being prepared is the whole thing, man. Because there was times earlier on that I thought, well, man, I, I'm, I know how to read. I know how to play to a click track, you know, like, you know, I'm waiting for that call, you know, what, and be frustrated or cocky or whatever. And I'm super thankful that it didn't come as early as, you know, 19 or 20, because I wasn't as ready as I thought. Do you think the way, like one of the most, a strategy to be successful in the business is to simplify your thinking process about it. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Do you think there are a lot of people that try to get in that overcomplicate it in their heads? Oh, you're preaching to the choir, man. It, it I, used I, to do yeah. me in. Yeah. It used to do me in, you know, like, when am I going to get a hit? When am I going to get a gig? When am I going to get a production? You know, it, <clears throat> the older I get to, you know, and we could go off on a huge rabbit hole on this, but. <laughs> I look outside for inspiration of uh, outside of music and, you know, I'm, I'm into this guy, Eckhart Tolle. Oh, yeah. He's a, and um, Dr. Wayne Dyer and some things like that. And, you know, it's, it's really about getting your head right for everything, Jim, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, like not rushing it, let life happen, live in the moment, relax, you know, everything's fine, you know, and if you can, if I wish I would have really honed in on those kind of things when I was younger, because I was so anxious, I had so much energy, I wanted to play, I wanted to write, I wanted to produce, I wanted to own the world, I wanted to catch the biggest fish in the lake, I wanted to chase the girls, and 
And, you know, maybe that's what youth is for. But, man, getting older and realizing that, you know, live in the moment. Like this show right now is all there is, man. I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. And this is like I'm, I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful to talk about music with other musicians and be in this moment and learn from you guys and be able to share. And I think for younger musicians to try to conceptualize that mentality at, at a younger age would be every bit as important as rudiments or learn your scales or learn a click track or anything. And I didn't know any of that, you know, but the, you know, when's my break coming and when's the phone going to ring and I didn't get any messages from anybody today, or I didn't make this audition or why didn't that guy use me again? Or, mm. Well, you think about it, you're saying a lot of, you hear a lot of that kind of thing. And there are a lot of I and me statements in there. Where's mine? For Where's sure. mine? Where's mine? And yeah. I'm a huge proponent and Rich has heard me talk about this many, many times. Be them centric, you know, uh, what is yeah. it for them? You know, and I, I coach yeah. a lot of uh, voiceover people who want to break into voiceover. Well, how do <laughs> I do it? Well, you start reading stuff, you record yourself and you listen back and see, and you do that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until you feel like you got something. Okay. Yeah. And then, well, then what? Well, then you get a demo together and you hang your shingle and you go on Fiverr or wherever and you figure it out, you know? And yeah, um, you know, so I kind of coach them from there, but they really do. Well, how do I get in? Just, yeah. And then when, and they have a plan and they want to rush it. And, you know, now that I'm on the other side, I'm, I'm at this starting to be like a, a crustier age where guys are like, oh my God, you've been riding a tour bus for 24 years. Let me take you out for coffee, Rich. I want to pick your brain. How many times a day do you get that message? Oh, man. And it, that's what prompted me to write several books. It was like, read the book. I can buy my own coffee. Right. But what do yeah. I do? I still end up going to the co for, to coffee yeah. with the kid pre COVID and he, and I end up buying him the coffee, yeah. right. Which is like a way to give back to the universe. But oh, yeah. I mean, it's easier said than done to relax and to stay completely in the moment. I mean, just this morning, my poor girlfriend who just walked in, she got to witness me dancing around the kitchen in my pajamas, singing the theme to flash dance. <laughs> I am a did, total did we get that on video? It's yeah. been videoed and I put it up as a story today. Good. And um, Tully's wife, Alyssa said, oh my God, I would punch him if he was my husband. Nice. So what? here's the deal. I'm trying to hold on to that, a little bit of that 16 year old energy when we got our first drum set. Let's see. We oh, have... is it there? And that's oh, me turning m &M, that's, that's me you. turning m ms into a, 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 a shaker. And that's our new episode of the podcast with our yeah. friend Jeremy Little on there. And there's Kara. She's a, she's a badass. And so, so, and then there is me there you go. doing the Irene Kara. <laughs> is that what a feeling? <laughs> <laughs> it was probably Jeff Carl. That was probably <laughs> Jeff Carl. Or oh, Lynn Drum Machine. I mean, there's so many that we have to face. I mean, I remember when yeah. the Lynn drum machine came out and the next thing I know it's, you know, Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it. Not a human was involved in that yeah. drumming department, but then our friend Jack Bruno gets to go out on the road and play that thing with Tina Turner for 30 years, yeah. you know, but Look um, at, uh, Mark with pink. Yeah. So, so you know, those songs yeah. for live. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's not a human drummer was involved in the making of any of her music, but he's got to go out there and bring that thing to life. So I guess it's a yeah. self-awareness of what is needed in the industry and what what yeah. uh, services can you provide and how can you solve solutions for people. Your YouTube channel, it's solving problems and it's all about you're a music surgeon. You have an alter ego. It's a relatively uh, new channel though, right? Yeah, That's yeah. The URL. Uh, yeah. Well, the URL, if you want to follow Bobby, here is uh, youtube.com forward slash channel forward slash uh, capital U, capital C, uh, small lowercase R D G B U R F K Z 6 V D 5 H Z D J B D J J Q forward slash feature. That address again is you. <laughs> well, what was after the. Wait a minute. What was after the four? I'm trying to put this in. Uh, it is. Uh, <laughs> let me get back to it. Yeah, yeah. So, the I mean, only thing um, you just have to look up Bobby Huff right. on YouTube and it'll come yeah, up. Yeah, I think yeah. if you search my name on YouTube, it'll come. Uh, there'll be a really mean looking bearded picture. My, oh, my yeah, point is angry. That it's so new. Yeah. It's so new that you have yet to achieve uh, the, the ability to actually get your own URL. 
So <clears throat> yeah, make sure you actually search it because at some point you'll be able to do that. All right, good. But a lot of the now, videos on it are very good. Very good. Very yeah. We, I just, you know, I, I, I was in, I was into this guy on great guy on YouTube named Rick Beato. Yeah. E A T O. He knows more about music than anyone I've ever met times 10. He could tell you what Lars snare side drum head is and tell you what key um, John Williams likes to write his scores in and uh, the, the most and, and how the cello parts bow. That's in. really crazy. And he has monetized oh. the hell out of it. Oh, he's doing incredible. So anyway, I thought I'm going to call this guy. This guy's so awesome. I, I just want to tell him he's awesome. Great. So I, I, I thought I, I know him somehow, but we don't know if we've ever met. So I, I Google his name and we both work with Shinedown, the band Shinedown. So I called the A&R guy. I said, hey, Steve-O, I, can I get Rick Beato's number? He's like, sure. So I call him, cold call him. He lives in Atlanta. Rick, man, you don't know me, but this is Bobby Huff. Oh, yeah, well, we kind of know each other, blah, 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 blah. I said, I, I, I got nothing other than to say you are so great at YouTube, and I learned so much. Thanks for doing what you do. Oh, okay, okay, great. I said, you know, then I did the, you know, obligatory. Hey, and if you're ever in Nashville, man, give me a call and we'll get a coffee, coffee or whatever. <laughs> yeah, hey. Hey, I'll be here all day, you know, try the veal. So, like, a month later, he calls me. It says, hey, I'm in Nashville for for Summer Nam. I'm like, oh, shit, this is great. I said, come on by the studio. So, we talked for three hours about, just like we are, mm -hmm. about all of our favorite drummers, records, guitar players, blah, 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 blah. At the end of it, he goes, you need to do a YouTube channel. I was like, I, I don't know anything about it. I, I've never been on camera. I don't know, unless I'm back in the back doing this, you know, and I don't know, uh, I, I don't I don't know anything about it. So. But you're so really embracing it with the surgery, the surgeon outfits and, and then yeah. you gave me a plug for my drum uh, loop pack, my <laughs> drum sample package and you were yeah. dressed up as a senator. Yeah, <laughs> Senator Bobby Huff. No, I thought, you know what, this is going to be fun because one, it's something else like we're doing now, like we've talked about through this whole thing, something else to direct my energies in and a way to give back something because I've been so fortunate to work with so many people, producers, mixers, artists, labels, you, you name it, that I may have something to say that someone might want to hear, someone may want to hear. You know? And so I, I try to, you know, do some stuff about drums or strings or vocals or, you know, keep it fresh. And it seems to be working. You so know, what is it, what are, what's one of the top performing videos? Because I noticed that there's some, sometimes there's some tricks, like you've got a title on one of the videos that says, these records suck. Oh, and yes. it's got the Beatles and Nirvana. Yeah. And then so but yeah. when, then, That's and your then most when you top open the video. One. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was my first one, too. So everybody I knew, you know, chimed into that one. But that one was like to really like how ridiculous critics were. Because the critics panned every one of those records. Um, the Beatles, U2, Toto, and um, uh, never mind, Nirvana. But, you know, so. Legacy records. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the mm -hmm. fabric of our life, right? You know, how they, they, they probably thought Neil Peart played too busy. So. You yeah. But, well, the next one, uh, music business, five music business musts, 849 yes. views. But I mean, you know, these are respectable numbers for a new channel. You've you only been doing this two months. Yeah, it's good. It, it's, yeah. it's going great. You know, I go into depth about how I wrote a song for um, or with um, Three Doors Down, um, some snare drum tips. Yeah, the um, snare how, drum trick. What's that? That, okay, I'm going to say this, and you guys are both going to steal it and and – is this the you one know, where you tune the snare drum to the key of the song? You tune this. You tune the snare drum to the tonic note of the song, because the tonic note, the one of the song, will never rub poorly against a four chord, a five chord, a two minor, or a six minor. Right. Wow. So yeah. you know, because it's funny because if you listen to only the young, his snare drum's in tune with the song. There I you just go. dawned on me. There you go. 
No, and my son, and that was Mike Beard who was doing that all the time. But yeah. I've tried that sometimes with that. There's a device called the uh, there's well there's a drum dial which is really nice to get drums yeah. in a crowded in a noisy room where you're really nice. And then there's this thing called the tune bot which will allow you to tune to specific tones. And I've experimented with that before. But sometimes the snare drum just won't go as high or low as the tonic. Yeah, yeah. and I and, and I address that in the video that like okay. You know, like you guys know, in any session, you want to bring three, four, five snares. When that happens, I'll switch out to another snare that I know will gravitate better to the tonic note of that key. Nice. That's also, really good. Also, what I do is once, like, if I'm playing a session for someone and I'm a hired gun, or I'm at home, if I'm at home, I'll also sample the snare with the snares off. So I'm just getting the dong, mm -hmm. which is really tonal, and you can really hear the tone of the snare. And then I'll trigger that sample with all the, the original snare part and mix that underneath. So you really get a sense of the, so the ring is there outside of the, the snare with the snares on. And then yeah. on a track, you can pitch it up or down however you want. Yeah, and you can, and you can, um, you can mix it according to taste. You know, you might yeah. just want that dong to be, you know, here yeah, and your original snares here. But it I really love, I, I love it, man. You know, I, I, I love that you can do all those things that you're so successful as a songwriter, producer, and a mixer. The idea of sitting in a room and making sure that it sounds great and having all my technology together and having the right speakers and, and learning that process, it's like, mm, I'm not going to do that. I, I, yeah, but the fact yeah, that you well, think that's cool. Well, that's one of those things I, that I've I, always seen myself doing is, is getting into a recording studio and really diving in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. This is what I did in radio, but I mean, it's a much yeah. bigger complex scale. Well, you know, but it's no different than I love this. So I'm going to learn this craft. Yeah. Just like if I'm a motivational speaker or I'm a, a radio host or I'm, I fix carburetors. You know, I really wanted to learn. I really wanted to learn how to mix because I heard so many songs come back that I produced or been a part of and I hated the mix and, and mm. I was toast. There's nothing I could do. They paid the mixer. He was a big name guy. I've also had a lot of big name guys that crushed the mix like Chris Lord Algie or David Bendith or Tom Lord Algie or whatever. So I'm not, I'm not being a big baby about this, but I knew it can only help me to learn that craft. So, yeah. and just like my, you know, my channel, there's so many, uh, there were so many channels, YouTube channels out there that you could learn bits and pieces. And all of a sudden you string together some knowledge after six months, a year, two years, three years, five years. And all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I think I'm mixing things that are competitive, hmm. but it, it's just like anything. It takes a shit load of time. Yeah. I'm always thinking about yeah. different show concept ideas for us to do for Rich and I to kind of go down. And I think that may be a recurring guest type of thing for you to bring you on and all three of us go back and listen to the stuff we produced early oh. <laughs> and have a big cringe fest. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. you mean it's like, 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 a, like yeah. a drum session that I played on in like mid-90s or something? Oh, yeah. 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 You know, and, you know, because I, I pulled, I, I came across a bunch of demos that I produced when I first started in radio. And I sat there with my head in my hands. I'm like, oh, I can't man. believe I sent this stuff out back then. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Well, we Every can't track. believe that we wore bell bottoms and, and you yeah. know. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, just, it would just be funny oh, to yeah. go back and listen to that stuff and go, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, oh. like, even even like the Absolutely. first Aldean record, you know, it's like there's cross stick and we could just, it was yeah. on a budget and his voice is completely like pre-whiskey and cigarettes. It's like, yeah. It's com yeah. And you probably know that as a producer and a songwriter, the guys you're working with, you know, the human voice is such a fragile, interesting instrument that it's so many things and it changes over the years. So why wouldn't our drumming and our approach to life and our philosophies and things For change? For sure. Yeah. For sure. 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 Yeah, my, I bet the first three years that I mixed, the drums were louder than anything else in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and, and the ambient mics on the snare, you know, like, yeah, who, need, who needs a singer? Uh, what was it? They uh, Dream Theater re-released re a bunch of songs that, you know, were, you know, shaped their career early on. And if you listen to their first album, Images and Words, 
the snare drum is triggered and it's badly triggered. It's, it doesn't sound bad. It's a, you know, but it's, it was 1992. So yeah, they yeah. did what they did. And I like, Por- yeah. Portnoy must have gone back and, you know, probably never liked it. So they remastered all of the tracks. But from the discerning listener standpoint, the only thing that's different is that he uses a live snare drum. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> He remastered it. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. No, but I, I just think that, you know, like, like we're doing now, the internet and YouTube. If, look, if everybody I know from 40 years younger walks around like this all day, looking at their phone, I figured I need to be a part of that. And I want to be a part of that. And if I have something to give back and I can grow a community and have fun doing it and commit to it, it takes a lot, as you guys know, it takes a lot of work. I'm a one-stop guy, man. You know, I shoot it, I edit it, I do, you know, but I'm committed to it and, and I'm, I'm starting to, I, I really enjoy it. Nice. So that's the reason for the channel. And, uh, and I appreciate you guys bringing it up. You know, I, yeah. I really do. It's new. I'm starting to get some followers and some momentum, but you know, as, as anything, we all need help. And I, and I'm new at this. Yeah. I'm not a know-it-all yet. <laughs> So that address again is https <laughs> forward slash colon youtube.com. You just look up Bobby with a Y H U F F and you're going to find it. It's great information. Bobby, what does your next five years look like, man? You got a plan or are you going to do the Eckhart Tully thing and just keep taking it day by day? Um, I think, I think the wise, wise thing to do is to, live in the moment and groove, but kind of have a outline. Mm. And as we all know, everything changes, you know, yeah. uh, you know, my best plans never came true. <laughs> so, I mean, my whole thing is, you know, I'm going to continue to do this channel. I, I've got tons of production and writing work. Um, keep my foot in the country thing, do some of that, you know, like I have been a lot of TV and film. Um, I still do some rock stuff. I just did a, a great band last year called Goodbye June. Nice. Uh, we did a whole record. Um, the, the record's called um, Community Inn. Uh, we did it here. We did it at Soundstage. So I'm, I'm, I stay fluid. I stay happy. I stay thankful. And shit keeps, seems to keep coming. I think that's you know? a, a, it's a, in a winning you know? model. I don't, yeah. I don't have any, I, I don't, I wouldn't retire well, you know, I, I, I fish all the time anyway, but like, I, I'm one of those guys that like, if I, if I'm at the beach, if I'm not smoking cigars at the beach, I'm like out of my mind, I, I've got to keep doing something. So yeah, I'll that. probably be one of those guys until they, you know, cigars Are you the on kind the beach? of guy. Yeah. Cigars on the beach. Oh yeah. You so guys cigar guys. How often are you, how often are you doing the cigars? I just got two beautiful cigars for my birthday from one of my students. Oh, well, too often. Um, I was yeah, about one. A, I was about one a day, which for me is a lot. And then, you know, my wife kindly suggested to me that um, cigars are the greatest contraceptive because I stink and my breath stinks. Yeah. So um, I'm I'm down to I'm trying to do one a week, and it pro- it's between one or two a week. Yeah. Um, not the greatest habit. Could be worse, but um, I. I I love them, man. It's yeah, a lot of people, the next you know. Morning. <clears throat> oh yeah, it smells like a, like a cat just died in your mouth. Um, yeah, like a which is another reason why my girlfriend is so cool because she doesn't complain. She goes, "Why don't you pour yourself a glass of wine and smoke a cigar?" I'm like, "This girl is great." And oh, is that yeah. how she sounds? She'll kiss me with the you know. But That's it's a, you know, I was at one at you know, I went to Joshua Tree for the weekend for my fiftieth, and I had you know two scars, and it was awesome. Yeah. What's your jam? What do you like? You know, I'm, I've, I've tried them all. I'm still finding, you know, yeah. br- you know, I, I, it's, there, I'm cosmopolitan because there's so many different yeah. things out there, but I've yeah. moved up to the medium strength. Oh yeah. Um, you're in, you're which in. gives you a, which gives you a, a, a kind of uh, like a buzz, almost like an alcohol yeah. buzz. It's like you get up, if yeah. you sit too long, you get up quickly. You're like, Whoa. Yeah. So you went from like Marlboro lights to Marlboro mediums. Yeah, it's, yes. none of it's good. It's not good for your teeth, your gums, your yeah. lungs, your anything. He's, but uh, whatever. He said it. He said it towards camel non filters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Camel yeah. wides no. is next. Yeah. Remember, yeah, remember those? I, what were they? Camel wides. 
No. Yeah, they were, they were like, wide. instead of like a traditional cigarette, they were about a little bit large. They were just wide cigarettes. Oh. It was like smoking one of these things. Oh. But hey, um, I love it. Anything well, worth doing is worth overdoing. Let me I'm ask you this. I, I, yeah. With the beach, uh, you mentioned before, so if I'm not on the beach with a cigar, are you the kind of guy that if you go to the beach with your family and after about a half an hour, you're kind of like, okay, now what do you do? Yeah, like during I the have, day. Yeah, yeah. I have to work at not being that guy. Yeah. I, I, too. I, I, it's, it's brutal, man. But, you know, here's the thing. When, you're, when you do what we do, your mind's always going. It's always you're, you're, you're thinking about stuff. You're thinking about the next script, the next this, the next this. And, and I think you kind of get into that's who you become. Yeah. You know, and I don't drink alcohol, so I don't have that to turn off. So cigars is kind of my, uh, you know, it, the other thing I love about it, cigars are so, are so social. Like cigar would, would be a great excuse for the three of us to get together and do this. Yep. And just so happened you're smoking a cigar. So I don't know. I, I, I like it. Cigar and a glass of wine, man. There's nothing like yeah, it. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah, we're we're definitely overdue for one uh, down in Spring Hill, buddy. I tell you yeah, that the much. Fire. Yeah. But the you know what I should definitely out. do is tell everybody the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com is the address. If you have questions, if you have praise, if you have criticism, at the same time, I am accepting gifts for my 50th <laughs> birthday that was on Saturday. So you can send me coffee, you can send me booze, and you can send me cigars. Just hey, well, my, yeah. my birthday was July 12th. Put me on that list. So you're My uh, birthday's coming up on answer? August 20th, so get okay, me Okay, there. there you go. Yeah. 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 So, Jim, do you have that special, this is that special time of the show that we have a jingle for and everything. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. So this is the random question of the show it's a question that i pull at random which uh the so such the name um and this is actually kind of something for both of you maybe both of you can answer this but bobby oh, wow. in 40 years what will people be nostalgic for oh man mm. besides the rich redmond show <laughs> uh Wow, what would they be? Um, <laughs> good music. <laughs> uh, guys, it's hard to tell. Like you know, now I can look back and go, "Oh, home telephones, newspapers." You know, but gosh, yeah. what like what now is? Uh, man, that's a good one. It, it'll probably be something wrapped around uh, more human interaction as we become more virtual and we're in the matrix and, and you know, even something like this is, I feel like is going to create societal changes where when we get back into society, are we going to be borrowing from uh, the Japanese culture and be bowing? What are we going to be? I already mm -hmm. feel like there's changes that are a result of things, you know? Yeah. We are at the uh, zenith of a we. We're going to be living through 1943 all over again. I could really go into that if you'd like to. Oh, what, just sum it oh. up, Jim, and what's the yeah. book that you got that information from? Because you're really encouraging me to read it. Yeah, it's uh, based on a book called Pendulum. And it's interesting that this question uh, specified 40 years. As we all know, uh, 40 years is very big in the Bible. And uh, it is basically um, it talks about the human societal condition and how we go from a me society to a we society. Me being uh, very individualistic and a we being a very civic group-minded type of society. And uh, the book says that we're going to zenith uh, in this we where we've been in an upswing for the past 20 years um, in 19 or, or 2023, which oh, will wow. look like 1943 because that's the last time we went through it. Wow. <clears throat> really? Yeah. Wow. And, and everything, the book, the book was published in 2010, 2011, I want to say. Yeah. Everything in that, they, that they kind of predicted um, is coming to pass. It's very, very eerie. Uh, a lot of witch hunts, a lot of, you know, social obligation, the things that we're seeing. Uh, it's going to be short-lived, but we've probably got another five to ten years of this. Wow. Yeah. Well, conceptually, that author, man, that's pretty, it's pretty bold and pretty big to be able to create a, like a hypothesis like that and draw all the... They draw it back, but they do it based on the past. Yeah. They take it back 3,000 years. Wow. How the, the pendulums have gone back and forth. And they all, it's basically based on uh, different 
if I could really sum it up in different parts of the upswing and downswing of the pendulum shift, you have um, series of I'm okay, you're okay, which are typically the uh, the tipping points on the bottom. Uh, and the flip side of that, when I think we went through it in 03, it was more you're not okay, I'm, or I'm not okay, you're not okay. Right now we're going through I'm okay, you're not okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, now what? I'm okay, but you're not. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it's just professional. And if you look at it, in, in the yeah. mid '90s, the mid '90s, as we came down, we were coming down from a. We were in the downswing of a we. So at that point, it was I'm not okay. You're not okay. And remember the the theme. Remember in the '90s, like self esteem was really low. Super. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, just grunge. because of all the shoe gazing, you know, the yeah, grunge. The flannel. Yeah. yeah, grunge. Yeah. Grunge. Grunge. You, you mentioned, you know, uh, Nirvana came out. It was like a light switch. Your right. hairbands went away. Yeah, and hairbands were happy, happy, fun and party music. Hairbands yeah. was hairbands yeah. was the last vestige of a me, which actually gets into um, hollowness, plastic posed feeling. You know, things that you know we as human beings we want to be something. You mentioned Gene Simmons before. He's actually a very big example of a, of a zenith of a of a me. Um, you know, he feels like he's a demon inside. So they dress up, disco, hair bands, all that stuff are all indicators of a wow. me. And right now, yeah, we're I mean, like there's nothing more yeah. inspiring and motivating and uplifting than an Alice in Chains record. <laughs> <laughs> You know, exactly. it's like, it's yeah, like when, exactly. when Paul, and this is 40, when Paul Rudd wanted to hang out with his wife and kids and he's like, listen to this, this is real music. And he starts playing it and the girls are like, this sucks. Let's yeah. listen to some hip hop. <laughs> exactly. It's a good book. And if you guys are readers, I totally recommend it. I mean, it's you either buy into it or you don't, or you, you know, no, it's yeah. a very heady book. So you, I, I recommend listening to it. So. Okay, I recommend drinking the wine and smoking the cigar before I get yeah. into the book or while I'm getting into the book. Yeah. Yes. But that's a great, a great answer, Bobby. And like, do you like to be found? What's the best way for people to find you? I would say the best place is go to my YouTube channel. Um, yeah. Just search Bobby Huff on YouTube and my videos are there. You can leave comments. Um, I'm, uh, and I, I'm all, actually, for the first time ever, I'm on Facebook too. So Bobby Huff on Facebook. I just so now what, ha what happened with that on Facebook? You were anti-Facebook since 2007 and then you just, what happened? Man, I, I, was no, I was like no social media guy. Didn't get mm -hmm. on any of it, whatever. But because of the channel, the YouTube channel, you know, I figured, well, you know, if I'm going to dive into this world, I'm going to get a Facebook channel. And, and I, Facebook. I, I, you, when we interviewed your cousin, Dan, he was like, no, nah, you know, I don't... Uh, do the social media and he's like, I don't, it's, it's kind of, we're like, well, you probably don't have to. And he's like, he's like, yeah, but if I was a young musician starting out today, I would be very active. He actually just never Mandatory. heard of it. So yeah. <laughs> Man Mandatory, totally mandatory now. I mean, to get your music out there and it's, you know, it's the way that we, uh, that we navigate and meet people too. So, you know, it would be bizarre. It would be strange being a young guy in music now going, all right, what does this look like now? You know, how do I like, how do I make a career? Well, it's going to probably be 20 different ways instead of three different ways. Yeah. But, you got to be, yeah, you got to be great at 20 things. Yeah. In, but in kind of fun though. Yeah. Kind of fun. And it's easier to be, it's easier to gain, to learn the information of those 20 things that you want to be good at because it's all on YouTube. Yeah, you, and also you've got Kajabi and Udemy and all these like uh, places where I look at Sheila E is now is teaching a master class on the master class platform. I always said to myself, people would always like email me like you should teach the drumming class on master class. I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, do you know who's teaching directing Ron Howard? You know, who's teaching yeah. acting? It's like, <laughs> yeah. so they're going to, they're going to get a Taylor yeah. Hawkins or a Dave Grohl, or yeah. something. but they yeah. got um, Sheila because she's Amazing. great at drums and percussion. And she's a great communicator. So Amazing. Um, it is a great Amazing. thing, but, this was so much fun. Jim, do you have any yeah. more questions for Bobby? Um, I'm good. I mean, uh, if you want to check him out, make sure to go to youtube.com forward slash channel forward slash UCR. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Bobby, I really, I mean, 23 years in Nashville coming up on 24. I am, like, we haven't seen each other. We got to get together yeah. for that uh, cigar. We're going to we'll make it happen. It. We're going to get through all this stuff. People are going to check out your YouTube channel. It's just so awesome to spend this time with you, man. 
Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having Good me. Good to meet you. I'll see you soon, Absolutely. right? Totally going to see you soon, man. Right. And uh, to all the listeners out there, to all our watchers, however you're consuming this content, we appreciate it. And it takes 30 seconds to leave us a high quality review. Leave us five stars. And um, yeah, what's that email address? Oh, for gifts, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. <laughs> and uh, we're on all the platforms. We love you. We appreciate it. Keep coming back for the good stuff. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.